This is a portable in-ear monitor mixing rig, and it pretty profoundly changed how I play music live. There are other videos on YouTube of bands building similar rigs, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to build a portable, flyable one, what my band Sungazer uses when we tour in Europe. But of course, the question is, what is the deal with this thing? Why is it so good? And why am I making a gear video? Well, it solves some problems that both logistics and physics present to modern musicians. The first, of course, being the speed of sound itself. Depending on the temperature, the speed of sound travels roughly 343 meters per second, or roughly a foot per millisecond. Which means, if you're standing 50 feet away from another musician and trying to play music with them, like in an orchestra, for example, or on a large stage, there is a 100 millisecond round trip latency. That level of ping, so to speak, is built into the speed of sound itself. I'm not gonna lie, it kinda sucks to train your musical reflexes to play music so precisely and then come up against the immutable laws of nature. So different genres end up dealing with this problem differently. Since the speed of light is so much faster, part of the job of an orchestral conductor is to keep everybody together through the visual of conducting. For some orchestras, you sync tempos more with your eyes and less your ears. Marching bands often compensate for the speed of sound by watching each other's feet move, and then catching the sound of the drummers in the back of the band as it propagates forward. For rock and pop musicians, acoustic sound is transformed into electric energy through microphones. This electric signal then travels a little bit slower than the speed of light through copper wire, and then can be mixed back into stage monitors, which play back the sound of all the instruments at the same time with no latency. But this then presents the next big hurdle, sound pressure level, or volume. Stage monitors can make stages dangerously loud, playing back the sound for everybody on the stage. Permanent hearing loss can occur at 90 decibels, but rock concerts regularly hit 110 to 120 decibels, and touring bands exposed to that level of sound night after night are guaranteed to develop tinnitus and hearing loss if they don't use robust ear protection. In-ear monitors are a technical solution to some of these problems. They deliver a zero latency electric signal directly to your ears and also help protect your ears from hearing loss. Now, fair warning, the rest of this video will be fairly gear centric in a way that's not typical for this channel. And so some of these things will be of only immediate practical concern to performers. I hope you stick around though, because there'll be a lot of design philosophy stuff sprinkled in. So I hope you enjoy my video on in-ear monitors and in-ear monitoring rigs. To get us started, this is more or less what I was hearing in my in-ear monitor mix at a recent show in Madrid. This, on the other hand, is the raw camera audio. Terrible. So how do we get here? Well, let's find out. This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream and to my streaming service, Nebula, where you can watch my new class, Capturing Musical Performances, all about how I do DIY music gig vlogs. Stay tuned to the end of the video to learn more. So first you need your in-ear monitors. I have three examples here, clearly neatly coiled. These are the Shure 215s. They are shit. Stay away from them. They break constantly. I've gone through like six or seven of them. Everybody I know hates them. Not worth it. These are the Mi Audio M6 Pros. They're about a third the price. They have pretty decent sound and are nigh on indestructible. They also are a lot more comfortable than the Shores. Honestly, these are great. These are my main monitors. They're Westone X50s. They sound great, but they always get super tangled, so I can't recommend them unless you really like untangling things. Once you have your in-ear monitors, you're gonna need some kind of receiver. Uh, the cheapest option would be some kind of passive receiver like this one. What that means is that a full usable personal in-ear setup can cost you less than $100. I've used this exact setup on a recent tour with the New York Chilharmonic in Aberdeen and it worked beautifully. I highly recommend it if you can afford it. Once you have your receiver, 
you're going to need to ask for an XLR aux send from the sound engineer. The sound engineer is then gonna mix the sound of all of the other channels for you during sound check the same way that they would give you a wedge monitor mix. Now, sound engineers normally love this because then there won't be extra sound coming from the monitors on the stage. It'll be a lot easier to give a clean front of house mix. It makes front of house engineers very happy. Mm -hmm. There are some downsides to this, of course, because it can take some extra time and sound check going down the line and getting everybody's in-ear mixes set. Can I get more kick, less snare? Okay, I think that's good for now. And honestly, unless the mix is really good, in-ear monitors can feel like you're really removed from the rest of the band. I used to really hate in-ear monitors for that reason, and it wasn't until recently where I became a convert. I feel like I'm more part of the band when I'm not wearing in-ears, but I think my time is way better with in-ears. But also, I have very bad in-ears. You got short. I have shorts. <laughs> My band Sungazer is an instrumental four-piece jazz fusion band that has evolved a somewhat unusual setup. We have eight drum mics, stereo left-right SPDSX Pro drum pad, stereo laptop for tracks, stereo bass guitar. This is very atypical, I grant you, but hey, I like a wide bass. Bass synth, saxophone, stereo keys, and a vocal mic for myself and our drummer, Sean. We then have two click tracks, believe it or not. Sean has his own custom click track with lots of subdivisions, and the band uses a much simpler one. We then also have a backup click coming from the SPDSX in case the laptop fails. We also have an audience mic that's just pointed at the audience to get some ambient sound in our in-ears, which actually adds a lot to the feeling of being connected to the room. That's 24 sound sources that need to be individually mixed for every member of the band. Unless a venue has a dedicated monitor engineer, a front of house engineer will just be overwhelmed at sound check. If we can control our own mix, however, we can set it so it's the same mix every night, especially if we travel with our own drum mics. You turn up to a show, your mixes are saved, all you do is plug in and you're ready to play. The monitor guy has the power to ruin your life on stage, and we wanna give you the power to ruin your own life. So touring bands are electing to build in-ear monitor rigs. And there are quite a few of these builds on YouTube already. There are even companies which specialize in them. We decided that we wanted to design our own rig. Since we tour in Europe often and have to fly places, this rig would have to be flyable, which means a very strict weight budget. Since we have status on United, we save money on overweight baggage fees, but even still, the whole thing would have to be under 70 pounds and have 24 channels of audio. That's not an easy ask. First, we need something to put the equipment in. Gator makes a fairly cheap 6U rack, but it's flimsy and would fall apart in the airplane cargo hold. Instead, we opted for a Circle 3 Designs 6U aluminum rack, which comes pre-fitted in a Pelican Air 1637 case. The idea here with this rig is that you're gonna take all of the inputs that you want to hear in your in-ear monitors, usually the microphones of the drums, the vocals, DI from the bass, etc., and then you create a physical copy of them. One set of XLRs goes to the front of house engineer, and then another set is going to go to your own dedicated mixing console that's just for mixing your in-ears. Many bands seem to go with Seismic Audio's mic split. These are cheap rack-mounted units that have two sets of XLR tails coming out of the back. Unfortunately, these are fully passive units. Phantom power can pass through every channel, which is good for some things, like powering drum mics, but it could potentially fry your equipment if the sound engineer accidentally has phantom power on the wrong channel, which can sometimes happen in the chaos of festival situations. We've had incidents before with fried audio interfaces. Passive can sometimes be scary, but you need some phantom power to send to the drum mics, so what do you do? Well, the Behringer Ultralink was an option. It's a cheap hardware splitter with eight total channels. It's about $100 in price, and it's pretty light. On the back is a ground isolated output that blocks any phantom power from front of house, but the other output is passive, so we could send our own phantom power from our mixer. However, we had some reliability issues with it, so we ended up going with the pricier, but ultimately more reliable, Art S8 8 channel splitter. The passive output on this, the one that we needed to send to our mixer for the phantom power, is in the front. We needed a total of three of these guys to get all of our inputs, and we have them all clearly labeled so that sound engineers know exactly where to patch everything in. The next thing to go into this rack is the rack mixer. This is the thing that sends mixes to our in-ears. These are usually controlled with an iPad app where you can adjust the levels of each individual instrument in the band. Now, if we were a smaller band, 
we would have gone with a 16 input mixer, like say the PreSonus 16R, which miraculously only takes one U of rack space. Larger bands often go with the Behringer X32, an older mixer, but something that is absolutely rock solid. Like I said, we're using the Behringer X32 system. Now the X32. Behringer X32. We ended up going with the 24 input PreSonus 24R, since it only takes up two U of rack space. It also has the benefits of having its inputs on the front, which is important because our splitter's passive outputs are also on the front. The idea here is that we plug the microphone coming from, say, the kick drum into its corresponding channel on the splitter. Then we connect the mic split to our mixer so that we can hear the sound of the kick drum in our in-ear monitors with another XLR. This XLR also carries the phantom power necessary to power the drum mic. Then we run an XLR from the back of the mic splits to the front of house engineer's stage snake. This is so that they can mix the audio for the audience. The first problem we ran into was that in order to keep everything plugged in while we were traveling so we don't have to constantly be patching and unpatching, normal XLR cables run up against the foam of the Pelican case. If an airline worker were to throw the case on its side, that XLR would break off inside the mixer. So we needed right angle XLR cables. These are relatively inexpensive, but very bulky and ended up blocking many of the inputs on our mixer. We couldn't quite figure out how to make them work. So the new plan was to get low profile right angle XLR cables, which are a lot smaller and mainly used in video and camera applications. These are not inexpensive to buy. Fortunately, we found a bulk supplier since we needed 24 cables, but in the ideal world, we would have just made these cables ourselves. I'm just an idiot bass player. I don't know how. From here, we would need to install our wireless in-ear receivers, the PSM300s, little rack units that can be mounted together to fill one full rack space. We ended up only needing two of these because only two of the members of the band are wireless, myself and the saxophone player. We connect our in-ear monitors to these packs. Jared and I like to run around on stage, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna run around. The pianist and drummer are wired, and they can connect their receivers directly to the back of our mixer with TRS cables. So with everything connected in so far from the mic split to our mixer, we now need to get our signals to the front of house engineer. We technically only need to send 20 signals because the rest are just click tracks and the audience mic, which go directly into our mixer for mixing in our in-ears. We could plug a bunch of XLRs into the back of our system every night on tour, but that's a bit of a pain. The whole point of this thing is to save us some time and hassle. We could leave these cables plugged in, but then they flop around in the cargo hold of any airplane. Instead, our solution was a 16-channel XLR Tascam BO16DX DB25 patch bay, which, if it isn't the name of a Star Wars thing already, it really should be. We take these XLRs from the back of the mic splits, plug them in here on one end of the patch bay, and then on the other side, there are two DB25 connections. DB25 is a 25 pin connector, kind of looks like an old serial port, that carries eight channels of audio. And DB25 to XLR snakes are cheap and easily replaceable. That means that all we have to do when we're setting up is plug in two DB25 cables and hand them off to our sound engineer. This is only 16 channels though. Originally, we were gonna use a four channel audio over ethernet snake for the remaining channels. Toman's the snake, but it proved incredibly unreliable on tour. So for the remaining four channels, we just have a couple of dangling tails that we just tie down. It's not pretty, but it works until we find something nicer. The next thing to go in is a rack shelving unit to house some of the power doodads, which are attached with dual lock and zip ties. Now you'll often see these rack mounted fancy power conditioners on similar racks. It's just a standard Furman. Furman rack mount power supply. A Furman power conditioner. We have a couple of power conditioners. But yeah, we learned early on that that is not the way to go when you're traveling because they are not dual voltage and straight up don't work in Europe unless you have a transformer. Instead, we just plug everything into a cheap universal travel power strip. It works dual voltage and accepts any kind of power plug. On this shelf, we also have a tiny travel router that we plug into the back of the mixer since the Wi-Fi signal of the mixer needs a bit of a boost if we're going to have any hope of getting signal. By this point, most of the rig has been built and we just need to plug in the router and the mix outputs from the back of the mixer into our wireless in-ear units. The whole rig fits snugly into the Pelican case. Now the question is, does this system work? 
Well, as you can probably tell by the wear and tear, the system has been through the ringer this fall, and with the exception of Toman's The Snake, it's worked perfectly. For several weeks, we entrusted airlines to all of this gear. Don't worry, we had an air tag in there for tracking, and it came out the other end more or less intact. Now, we paid full price for all of the gear in this rack. We didn't have any artist discount or anything. And all told, this investment was over $6,000. <laughs> Which, I want to be clear, is not what you need to spend in order to get the benefits of in-ear monitors. Zero latency monitoring and ear protection. You can get the same results with a rig that's literally one one-hundredth of the cost. The only reason why we did it this way, honestly, was to... <laughs> Uh, avoid dealing with bad sound engineers, which I think says quite a lot about bad sound engineers. Now in September, Sungazer was on tour in the US with the Wednesday Night Titans. We had recently switched to playing fully on in-ears. I remember at one point we were talking shop with the Wednesday Night Titans about our setups, and just kind of like as an offhanded comment, uh, the drummer of the Wednesday Night Titans, the amazing Zach Danziger, told our drummer Sean Crowder that you play like you can hear yourself. And that, comment, you play like you can hear yourself, for whatever reason, has really stuck with me. I think it speaks to the years that we have played without hearing ourselves, by literally hurting ourselves with stage volume, trying to get things balanced and not quite getting there. That frustration of not quite being able to hear and react to the nuances of each other's playing, feeling distant somehow from ourselves and each other, bathed in a cacophony of muddy, indistinct nothingness. And if you can hear yourself better, then you play better, right? Like hearing yourself. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. So. <laughs> Now, I normally don't like talking about gear in videos because it, it feeds into this consumerism, but music and technology are always linked and you kind of have to talk about gear if you talk about music and how it's made, especially in the year 2022. Rack mounted tablet controlled mixers have become ubiquitous over the past five years. And YouTube in particular has been a great source for information sharing and system development. The videos that I've excerpted in this video were extremely useful in designing our rig, and I hope that this video may give you some inspiration or at least some understanding of how live musicians are making music live and the tools that they use to do it. If you're interested in all of this gear stuff, you can learn more about how I document my live performances over on Nebula. Nebula is the creator-owned streaming service where many of your favorite educational creators have extra bonus content as well as classes that you can take. The class that I just released, Capturing Musical Performances, is a step-by-step -step guide on how I do my gig vlogs, what equipment I use, how I edit the videos, and how I tell the musical story. Our brains do this thing where if you are seeing something being played, we perceive it as being louder than it actually is. This can be very useful. You can almost do a subtle tweak to the audio mix, at least perceptually, by showing what instruments you want when within the video edit. Very cool. This is, of course, one of many classes that you can take over on Nebula. It's a great place to watch and discover great content, ad-free, as well as support your favorite creators. This video is also brought to you by another fantastic streaming service, CuriosityStream, the go-to source on the internet for the very best documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from. If you've ever wondered where great educational television went, it's over there on CuriosityStream. I recommend the 12-part series, Great Film Composers, a deep dive in the history of cinema and music. If any of this sounds good to you, you can either go to the link in the description or curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely, and you can get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for just $14.79 per year. By clicking the link on the screen right now, you're not only supporting this channel, but all of the other creators over on Nebula as we create content that aims to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thanks everybody for watching. 
I hope you uh, stick around also to watch more videos. And uh, yeah, until next time. Hey.